In our last video, we showed the first day of framing of our house, and in no way did we expect how much got done. So they worked 12 hours yesterday framing, and we thought they had stopped at framing the exterior walls and the interior walls, but when we came out after they had cleaned up and left for the night, we noticed they had started sheathing. So behind me, you'll see some of the houses sheathed. And this morning, we thought that uh, they were going to take the weekend off and not work, but at seven o'clock this morning, they showed up. And what they wanna get done today is sheath the whole exterior of the house. These are nine foot walls, so the sheathing actually goes all the way up to the top plate in one continuous piece of sheathing. But over here on this side, because this is a gable end, the sheathing only goes up eight foot because when they frame up uh, the gable end on the trusses, they wanna tie the wall to the actual gable end. So that's why they left that little space right there. So they have nailers for the next piece that goes up. Later in the video, Deb and I will take you inside and kind of walk you through the house the best we can. There's a lot of support boards that are in there that are keeping the house square until the trusses go on next week. When I was 16, I worked for a builder and, and I did some of this stuff, but um, it was a different environment up in Virginia. Different regions build differently. And what you try to do here in Florida is keep your roof from lifting off. So by tying the trusses into the, the vertical walls, that just helps keep everything together in the event of a major windstorm. They're waiting for the LVL for the garage. And if you don't know what an LVL is, it's an engineered piece of wood to span a long distance. You can see that the headers for all the doors and everything are two by 12s. The framing's two by four, but across here, that's just too long for a two by 12. And the guys did a truly amazing job cleaning up everything last night. They left no trash, they organized everything. And they even made a little shed to store the nails in so they don't get rained on. And we had an architect design this house. And you think about the rooms, it's not until they start to get defined by lumber and walls and stuff that you think, um, you know, how will you use it? And when those, that space is defined and we started looking at how we would use it, uh, we had to make just a couple of subtle changes before it was too late to make any changes. So that's uh, one thing that, that we're learning. Probably the only house we're gonna build in our lifetime as far as a custom build. But leave a comment down below. Have you built a house before and did you make changes right up? I mean, literally to the last minute because as they're framing, once it's framed, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of time to uh, tear all that out. But we caught it in time, won't cost us any extra, but we're very interested if other people made those on the spot changes. When I worked a summer in construction and also doing construction with my dad, we uh, put in all the nails with a hammer. Nowadays, everything is with a pneumatic um, nail driver or a pneumatic nail gun. And I wanna show you just how many nails have to go in to meet code now in Florida. In this part of the wall, you've gotta have a nail every four inches. And then in the field, which would be out here where the studs are, there has to be a nail every six inches. So you can just see the quantity of nails here. And the sheathing is what gives you that uh, monolithic um, structure, you know, kind of ties everything together. So I don't know how many nails he just put in, but imagine having a hammer and having to put in, you know, those 12 nails that he just put in in literally seconds. So the big deal for rigidity and structure is that you want that piece of OSB to be continuous. No breaks on the horizontal plane going from the bottom sill plate all the way to the top plate. And that just ties it all together. So if you're not familiar with construction, you have your monolithic concrete slab with footers. So you've got a stable base here, and then you take a treated board, and you have J-bolts that are embedded in the concrete, and this treated board is bolted down to the concrete, and then you have your studs that are nailed up to your sill and your top plate. Okay, there's two two by fours on top of the wall. So that's all held together. And then we're gonna run metal um, threaded rod. So you'll get a coupler that goes on top of here and then threaded rod will hold this whole wall down to the concrete. And then all the windows 
and the trusses and everything will have metal strapping. So you'll have the headers and everything strapped with metal, and then you'll have metal that goes up to the trusses so that there's absolutely no way it can lift. And most of the Florida codes for uh, wind loading were developed uh, from Miami-Dade County. It was a major, major uh, hurricane that totally destroyed Miami. And uh, Miami-Dade County came up with a lot of these codes that have recently, like I think within the last four years or so, been um, incorporated into all of Florida. We mentioned hurricane strapping a minute ago, and here's a good example of where you've got the vertical two by four, the header for the window, and then the top plate all tied together with a piece of metal, and then nails every couple inches that ties that two by four, all that together. And remember, we'll have the threaded rod that goes from the top all the way to the bottom. And they're special structural nails. They've got more shear strength. During Hurricane Michael in 2018 in Panama City, where we live on the coast, we had up to 220 mile per hour winds and some, some structures just didn't survive. Some of the older structures that weren't tied down. But there was a direct hit to Mexico Beach and actually went out to Mexico Beach after the storm to buy something off of Marketplace. I guess it was a, a month after the storm, maybe two months. And I pulled up to this house that looked brand new. And uh, I said, did you get your house rebuilt already? Because it was hard to get any building done then because everybody needed a roof and everybody needed their houses fixed. And he said, no, this is the way it looked like after the hurricane. And he took a direct eye wall hit. And because it was built to the codes that we're talking about here, um, he had hardy board siding and a metal roof. His house literally looked as good the day after the hurricane as it did the day before. And that's what we're going for here. We are actually going to use um, plywood sheathing for the roof and um, just take basically every precaution necessary to ensure that this thing can survive a major hurricane. Let's hope we never test it out though. After the foundation was poured, I spent a couple days out here with the tractor, screeding out the concrete from the dirt and getting all this level. One, because I like a a clean look you know around a construction site and two because it just makes it easier for the workers to work and they don't have like mounds and stuff from digging out the footers but what i'm going to do now is just run my magnet over here and just look for nails and stuff and the guys already did this i saw them out here last night and since i got the magnet and i got the time when i was young i was very skinny and um about 140 pounds when i graduated high school and to put that in perspective i'm uh I'm over 200 pounds now. On the construction site, I was the guy that put some of the sheathing on. We did what's called plywood the corners, and I would plywood the corners to make it stronger and uh, have to do it by myself. I think I was probably making seven bucks an hour or so, but uh, that was my job. And that was on a two-story house, so I actually had to take full sheets of plywood and push it up the ladder ahead of me and then like hold it with my nose or my forehead and using a hammer, not a, a nail gun, using a hammer, get a nail in to hold it. Fun times, fun times. No way I could do that nowadays. I just saw something that reminded me when I would put up the plywood on the corners, I would put a nail there to hold the plywood on the bottom because I did, wasn't strong enough to keep it from slipping down. I've gone all the way around the house the best I could with all the lumber and everything that's in the way, but this is what we got. Not bad at all, actually. There's a screw, some used nails. I don't see any um, nails from the concrete. That's a special type of nail. These are all framing nails. Remember we talked about the structural nail for the hurricane strap. That's one of them right there. See how that's shorter and thicker than these uh, ring shank nails that are used on the, on the framing. So yesterday when they were framing, I couldn't be more impressed with the crew. There was eight guys, they were a well-oiled machine. I watched them all morning. Deb came out a little bit later in the morning. She said the same exact thing. And eight guys just running around, not really even talking much to each other, just knowing, like the left hand, knowing what the right hand's gonna do. And got this all framed up in 12 hours. It was ridiculous. They started working at seven. First wall went up at 7.26, I think. And they took a real quick lunch in the shade over there. 
by their lunch time, they had like it basically framed as far as uh, the general structure. Not all the windows and everything, but all the vertical walls. I spent several days with the tractor cleaning and screeding all the chunks of uh, extra concrete or concrete that was um, just spilled everywhere. And I just went around the foundation and I got that many more in just a couple minutes. We want the foundation to sit the way it is and then we're gonna brick around it. So we're not gonna backfill it with dirt. So all these concrete pieces I'm picking up are just to prevent them from getting caught in the lawnmower. And that's the elevation we wanna keep of the house. We don't want the dirt to come up any higher on that concrete. So that's why none of these concrete pieces that I'm picking up are gonna get covered with dirt or sod because it's simply, we're not gonna add any dirt there. We're just gonna grow grass in the existing dirt and show as many of those bricks as possible. But about six brick courses along the bottom of the house before the hardy board siding starts. So this is what you have to do when the stud is directly over the J-bolt. You gotta bridge it, otherwise you can't put a stud there. Not only for sheathing of the outside, but also the internal drywall. The expectation is there's a stud every 16 inches. So sometimes you gotta get creative because they didn't measure out the J-bolts when they put them in the concrete. They just, you know, kind of, I won't say randomly, but they stuck them in in what they thought was um, a good spacing, but it doesn't always line up with framing. And that's very common. And just like that, four more feet has is, is got sheathing on it. Okay, the crew has left for the day and Deb and I have been doing a bunch of running around. So we actually haven't been in the house since they left. Okay, step up on your porch and go into your soon to be front door. All right, so I'll just kind of follow along behind you and let you guide us. All righty, so I've just come in through the front door. This will be our foyer or our entryway. And immediately to our left, we'll have a, a den area. So if I come in the front door, I can go straight into the living room or I can take this left into a small den. This room will have a great view of the pastures and of the barn and of the pond. So this little room will get a lot of use. Well, if I come out of here, I'm now standing in our living room. We'll have a tray ceiling. So we'll have ceilings at, um, I think it's gonna go like eight feet and then nine feet and then angle up to 12 feet. And the TV will be on that wall over there. Couches will be in an L right here. Are you gonna stand where the TV will be? So let me, uh, let me stand by the sink. So you'll be able to see the TV from the kitchen that I'm standing in. So this wall right here, there's a small wall here, and then there's a small wall here. So whereas it's not open concept, it's open, it just gives the feeling of having a separate kitchen space, but yet not feeling so closed in. I mentioned earlier that we did literally last minute changes mm -hmm. as they were framing and caught something that we didn't like. We <laughs> <laughs> That's on camera too. She literally hopped like a bunny. <laughs> like a kangaroo. I mean, she didn't jump. She just hopped. She hopped. Wow. <laughs> Back I'm to sorry. the den. That was crazy. So we do really appreciate the crew and our builder letting us make a couple last minute changes before they built anything, right? But it was still on the fly. So as we mentioned, this den area is kind of a small room, but it'll give us the view that we want. It's a nice hangout room. But we found when we came in and looked at the space that since it is a smaller room, the doorway was too narrow and it was gonna feel more closed in. So we had them push out the walls more and give us a wider doorway. And that would just give us, again, more of kind of an open concept feel, but yet you still get some division between rooms is kind of what we wanted. So we did achieve that. So that started out as six foot and we pushed it out to eight foot wide. The kitchen will be your standard kitchen. There'll be an island, we'll have a sink to, so I can keep an eye on Brad, you know, when he's in his, his mega shed. But our breakfast nook, what we didn't, I guess, envision and what ended up happening is it does have walls. And in our minds, it wasn't going to be separated, but it's our fault, right? Because it was in the plan. So we didn't actually notice this until it was built. It'll be nice, but this was a... A surprise to us for not paying better attention. 
Yeah, we came into the house after it was framed and we both looked at each other because when they were framing that wall, we were like, oh, we think the architect put in that wall so the fridge would have something to go against rather than the fridge being the separator between the um, breakfast nook and the kitchen. Well, then they built this little wall right here and put a header over it. Last night we went and got the drawing out and we're like, well, it's built to the drawing. So if we had caught that before, like we did that other opening, we would have either made that opening wider or maybe just left that wall on that side for the fridge yep. and left this wall maybe open because right here will be a four foot wide by eight foot long island. It worked a lot with the architect to make sure that there was no interference with the island in the wall. Well, if this wall wasn't here, there would be no interference. But anyway, we've got a breakfast nook and uh, it is what it is at this point. We talked about that window last night. What was my idea with that window versus your idea? Brad wanted a double window here. He wanted a double window, but, but the way I look at it... Because if you're at the sink, this is what you would see when you're washing dishes. There's two of us. We don't generate that many dishes. So out of all the places in the house, all the views, this is the one that I care least about, I would say. And, and the reason that we made that window smaller is so that we'll have more walls for um, kitchen cabinets. So coming out of the kitchen, little hallway, there'll be a nice pantry that I'm really excited about because we don't really have that in our current house. And then, <laughs> excuse me, don't pardon fall, me, babe. excuse me. <laughs> and then next to the pantry, there will be a half bath and then the mudroom. Let's, this was a very um, last minute feature of the house. So let's talk about that mudroom and how you got to where you're standing right now. The mudroom was always in the plans, but having it covered was something the architect added. This will be covered all the way here. So we didn't have that stoop in part of the original plan and we were just gonna have a door there and just walk straight to the door. And the architect saw that and he said, hey, how about this idea? He um, will, will give you a, um, I guess, more, more design to your roof line. We'll bring the roof line over top of that stoop and that way you'll protect the door from rain so you don't get rot on the side of the door. And also you'll be covered when you come in the door because that'll be the main door we use going in and out of the house. But let's go around here to the porch and then we'll just kind of quickly go through the last couple of rooms in the house. So when you come out of the den and then the living room, we'll have sliding glass doors that will go to a covered porch. And this will allow us to let Bella out in the backyard when we don't want to have to keep track of her on 20 acres. And it will be covered so we can rinse her feet when she comes in, we can grill out here, we can have a covered area. Yeah, we'll be covered up till that line right there. And then that's just an open patio. And that door goes to the garage, so you'll be able to Go from the garage to the patio. We're gonna have a water bib on the side there so we can wash Bella off when she's done running in the yard. It's kind of a place to put the grill, a place to let Bella out, but we probably won't be spending a lot of time back here. The house is not designed to be a backyard house. We reorient you, that's the wall where the TV will be, that's the front door. Come in the front door, take a right, what happens next? Take a right, go down the hallway, Air conditioning closet, linen closet. Over here. Bedroom. Where are you at? <laughs> Spare bedroom. Okay. And then nice uh, space what's... with this closet. Come and on out come of on that. Down the hallway. Are you gonna call? You're gonna cut. I, take a shortcut. I took a shortcut. Come further down the hallway. There's the entrance into the second spare bedroom. This is the second bathroom. Second full bath. So that's the a guest full bath. bath. Yep. Yeah, guest bath. Okay. The Come now, into the master bedroom here. Now I'm in the master. So this is my super cool walk-in closet. We wanted light in here, but it's a bedroom. So you want some privacy and, and our neighbors on that side over behind those trees. So we went with a transom window there and then two three by fives there. This doorway behind you goes into... The master bathroom, private yeah. potty room. And cut through the two by fours there, and, and the what's that space? This is a stand up shower. This door has to be adjusted because Deb wants a special feature where she's standing right now. Well, I want a soaker tub, and it was designed for like a 28 inch wide soaker tub. And I'm not a big person, but I would like a little elbow room in my soaker tub. So the builder said I can go out to 32 inches. So they're just going to slide that door down to accommodate a little wider of a tub. So yeah, my soaker tub and stand-up shower and 
private potty. So hard to believe that this is only day one and a half of framing. It's pretty much sheathed and ready for trusses, which will be next week. We'll be dried in here quickly. And when you're dried in, you think, man, we're like 50% done with our house. You're at best 25% done because you still have HVAC and plumbing. Electrical. And then, yeah, electrical that goes in the walls before you put on your sheetrock and, and all those other things. So um, although it's going to look a lot like a house, it's still going to be many, many months before we're able to move into it. But we're going to go ahead and wrap up this video. Day two of the actual framing is over with. Deb, you want to go ahead and close out the video? Well, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you continue to follow us on this journey and share our forever home and our dream with us. Take care. God bless and have a great week. Take care, y'all. We'll catch you on the next one.